Uh, Addis Continental was established um, in 2006, uh, in uh, August, and um, uh, we had two uh, major um, missions. One is to uh, bridge the gap between the north and the south, and second is uh, you know to expand um, uh, postgraduate education at an affordable cost. Uh, for uh, Ethiopians and Africans. So these were uh, the two uh, missions we had. And um, we focus uh, on three areas, um, short-term training, uh, long-term training, and uh, research. Uh, we do uh, long-term trainings, particularly uh, in collaboration with uh, national universities. Currently, there are six uh, universities, public universities, that are working with us. Um, and uh, we have um, increased um, opportunities for uh, masters in public health, uh, I would say almost by 500% uh, since, we were, since we started uh, collaborating with these universities. So um, there are a lot of students uh, who benefited from this uh, program. With regard to research, um, uh, we work um, with the Federal Minister of Health, uh, regional health bureaus, uh, and UN agencies like uh, WHO, UNICEF, um, and um, uh, we work a lot um, collecting data um, uh, at the population level and providing uh, evidence uh, that are needed for uh, of, uh, improving practice uh, and also making um, decisions, policy decisions. Uh, so these are some of the activities, yes. Okay. <laughs> but how many master's <coughs> students uh, have graduated? We, I think over 750 master's students graduated from the program. And uh, we have um, 31 PhD students. You know, one defended uh, last year in May. And five of them are ready now to defend uh, in May, June this year. Okay, so uh, that's also um, uh, capacity building for uh, public universities. Uh, so we start a joint program in masters, but we want them to take over after three to five years of working together. We want them to take over, and we are preparing them for that. Mm. What type of positions do your students hold? Upon graduation? Well, that's a, that's a wide range of, you know, many of them uh, would be taking um, key positions in NGOs. Uh, some of them go for, um, uh, you know, teaching positions in universities. Uh, and some go to regional uh, and federal ministry of health positions. Uh, but quite a number of them have also. Uh, went to uh, a lot of African countries, you know, taking positions at the Minister of Health or uh, with NGOs. So we have, yeah. Excellent. You also said one of the missions is to bridge the North and South gap. Can you talk about that? Like, what's the, what's the purpose for um, that mission? That yeah, that? I mean, that is, I think, one of uh, the activities we do with major evaluation. So when we started, um, uh, let's say monitoring and evaluation was um, would not practice widely. You know, the theory principles have not been understood very well. Uh, so we have been working with um, major evaluation since we have been established to uh, to bring a lot of Africans to for um, basic training. And this year we have expanded that to HIV and uh, data analysis workshop. Uh, so these are the kind of things we want to do, you know, to bring uh, up-to-date, you know, professionals, um, decision makers on, uh, on some of the uh, public health um, issues, uh, you know, particularly in generating evidence that are important for decision making. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that one of your focus areas is in research. Are your students engaged in the research process? And if so, what value 
do they yield from that experience? Um, you know, uh, you know, traditionally, public health decision used to be based on estimates um, uh, and also, uh, you know, professional opinion. So we want to change that, and um, uh, both our masters and PhD students are engaged in research, and we try to focus mainly on issues that are relevant to African setting. And we also want uh, them to understand the process of research, conducting research, as well as utilizing um, findings for decision making. Yeah, so, so we, w I would say, you know, we are in a sort of um, transition, you know, from guess uh, uh, based decision making to evidence based decision making. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what is the demand for? Making that transition, what prompted the shift? Um, well, it's also following uh, international trend. Now there is a lot of um, demand for evidence. Uh, and I would say, you know, both at the Minister of Health uh, and regional health bureaus, there is a huge demand actually for quality uh, data and um, evidence um, generated uh, from quality data. So. Uh, um, things have changed a lot, things have changed a lot, but we have um, huge resource limitations. Um, one or is um, actually skilled uh, human resource, um, so that's uh, an area where we are working heavily now. You know, we want to produce people who can do quality research. What type of increase have you seen, or trends have you witnessed over say, the past Four to six years. Well, there is a lot. I mean, if when we uh, we have a lot of demand for local training, and we have been doing um, at least one training every year, uh, but uh, now um, we started also master's training in monitoring and evaluation in collaboration with one of the public universities. So within uh, we with a very short notice, actually, we were able to fill. Uh, seats. Actually, we, we took more than we expected to take for the master's program. Uh, so I would say there is a huge demand. Um, so we started the training here in Addis, but uh, we are getting um, requests from regions. So we are hoping in September uh, 2013 we'll start the same program in Makale, uh, northern part of Ethiopia. And we'll see how uh, it will um, evolved from there, but uh, currently there is huge demand for monitoring and evaluation. Excellent. Excellent. Mm. What was your first contact with measure evaluation? Well, it was in 2005. Um, I was um, uh, then working uh, at Aditaba University. Uh, so, um, so measure evaluation contacted us, you know, to start the Anglophone uh, the regional training for Anglophone Africa for uh, uh, population health nutrition. And then we start uh, working together since then. Um, I like working with major evaluation because um, uh, we start from scratch planning, you know, uh, we set agenda together and we work together and uh, the staff from major evaluation um, uh, were just amazing. I mean, um, so we uh, we enjoyed working with major evaluation. We keep on working. <laughs> What's the nature of the partnership? The nature of collaboration, uh, I would say, it's unique. Uh, it's often very consultative. Uh, you know, trying to understand each other's needs, um, and also we uh, build on um, uh, the gaps we have. Um, and every year we see that um, we are improving, we are getting more uh, and more. Um, so that is, uh, um, that's very interesting I mean, in, in our collaboration. How do we know we're improving and what are we improving? We, well, we, we are um, improving um, um, our um, training materials uh, every year. Uh, and uh, we are uh, improving also uh, uh, every year. I think we have done 
three uh, training of trainers. Uh, so we are not um, uh, depending only on a few trainers. Um, so every year there are new trainers uh, joining um, uh, our collaboration uh, with different um, kinds of expertise. Uh, so that's one uh, improvement. And the second improvement is, um, uh, in fact, you know, we uh, see it also, the demand that we create. Still, we receive um, applications from um, uh, a range of African countries, from west to east, from north to south. Uh, so uh, that is um, the second thing. The third thing is also, in all our activities, uh, there are um, uh, monitoring and evaluation activities. So we actually evaluate our training and every year um, the um, assessments are great. I mean, they are improving and people are uh, extremely happy with the, with the training that we are offering. What are some examples of feedback that you received? Well, the feedback we, we receive is um, one uh, uh, with the content of, uh, of the course and how relevant that is to their um, daily um, um, you know, duties and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And the second feedback we get is actually we um, stimulate uh, you know, people to uh, seek or demand um, for more evidence. Um, and also people see uh, the importance of um, you know, emphasizing quality in monitoring and evaluation. Um, and, and we see also um, increasing demand for higher level training. You know, people now see, you know, previously we focused on basic monitoring and evaluation, but now people um, ask us for impact evaluation, which is at a higher level. And that shows you also the growth in, in the profession. You know, people just were really interested to see the short-term uh, effectiveness of their program, but now people are interested more to see whether their program is making, um, um, you know, significant change uh, in the target population. Um, so that's uh, that's how I see Excellent. improvements. Yeah. Let's talk about the content, if we can, we go to the content of the training materials just a bit. Are any measure evaluation tools implemented or integrated into your training materials? And if so, could you give me a couple of examples? Um, yeah, we try to uh, integrate them as we go along. Um, you know, one of uh, the um, tools that we have integrated with uh, the data and demand and uh, data use uh, module, which was not uh, originally in our um, population health and nutrition um, training package, but you know, later, when, especially when we implemented uh, the early marriage project, uh, and then you know, we want to bring um, findings into practice, uh, we saw a clear um, demand for that. So we had a stakeholders meeting, and that the stakeholders meeting, you know, it was, uh, it was clear that we needed uh, to integrate that. Um, uh, so that is one. And now also, just to give you another example, major evaluation I've been using is the PLATES methodology for identifying um, where people meet new partners. Um, uh, so this, when we planned um, the HIV uh, workshop, uh, that's one of the modules uh, we want to integrate. Uh, and in fact, you know, we ha some of our students have used the tools already uh, because that is, I think it has not been used in Ethiopia before. Uh, so after talking um, with uh, major evaluation staff, you know, we, we got the, the complete set of the material and we tried to implement it here. And um, we got uh, some interesting findings. <laughs> Some examples of the findings. What, what, what was interesting? Well, what was interesting, you know, like, um, you know, for um, we used uh, it to identify, um, you know, where young um, um, high school students actually meet new partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did it in, um, 
in Addis Ababa and uh, in Dabradeis, a little bit uh, out of south from Addis. Uh, so it clearly showed, um, uh, especially the school um, officials, the education officials, you know, um, where things are happening, uh, where uh, students go uh, and what at one time and what kind of people they are meeting. And that um, also triggered an uh, interesting discussion between, uh, uh, among, you know, the teacher-parent uh, uh, associations. You know, they have, you know, every school have they, they have some kind of committee. And it was presented there and they discussed it and uh, it shed it actually some uh, light into this um, dark area where nobody knows where students go, uh, especially in our country where, you know, s sexual taboo is uh, still uh, a taboo, you know, for, uh, especially for young girls uh, and so on. They, don't, they can't talk with friends, with parents, with teachers openly about their sexual relationships and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was quite... Uh, Interesting. Um, if we could go back and segue into the early marriage study, can you talk a bit about that, about the, how we um, took the findings and put them into practice? Yeah, you know the early marriage study, I would say it is, it was and it's still I think one of the biggest, um, if not the biggest study in Ethiopia uh, with regard to early marriage. Um, and that um, we actually try to collect information from adolescents and also from parents. Uh, so we had uh, a fair representation of girls and boys um, in the interview. And um, that was one unique thing about the research project. But uh, more importantly, as soon as uh, we finalized um, uh, the study and uh, did the preliminary analysis, we had actually a stakeholders meeting and um, people were invited from every village that we have uh, conducted uh, study. So that was um, very much appreciated and there was um, small group discussions, you know, people discussed the findings, what it meant for them, you know, what can be done um, based on the findings. Um, that was also a unique thing um, for um, because uh, we are used to large surveys being conducted, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, you compile a report and um, you, you don't communicate that very often to um, to study participants. So that was uh, interesting. And then, you know, um, uh, in that study also, we engaged um, uh, relevant uh, government bodies and civil societies. You know, the women's association which is an independent uh, organization, and also the Women's Affairs Ministry or Bureau. Uh, so they had a formal, they, these are the organizations with formal mandate, you know, to, um, uh, to work on early marriage. So they, uh, they were active participants, and um, we engaged them throughout the process, um, and they, uh, they also used some of the findings later on. Yeah, I heard, yeah, yeah, that's what's interesting, yeah. Tell me, what were the findings? The interesting findings were there was, at that time, very active, um, uh, you know, movement uh, to um, reduce early marriage in, uh, in the Amara region. But there were also a lot of things happening, you know. People were not um, uh, open to talk about it. People had uh, concerns, uh, you know, whether um, they are doing the right thing for their girls, you know, sending them to school. Um, and uh, we have seen also what coping strategies uh, girls might have um, if they face like um, uh, violence uh, when they go to school and so on. Uh, so this was, those were uh, some of the uh, major findings. Excellent. How were they used? Well, it was, um, as I told you, uh, the uh, women's um, affair. Uh, they, act, uh, you know, they demanded for the report, and they took the report. Uh, we provided them actually with many copies, and uh, they were um, uh, incorporating that into their uh, program, and they tried to um, see 
how they could they can also improve some of um, their uh, program objectives. Excellent. Could you describe to me your involvement in the study process? Well, in this, our involvement, well, you know, was, um, you know, throughout uh, it was um, a collaborative undertaking, and um, we involved uh, from the beginning um, stakeholders in the in the region. Uh, we discussed uh, the uh, protocol, uh, what we are going to do, and um, they uh, facilitated the field work uh, in some of the areas. They they went uh, out with us to the supervision to see how data were collected. Uh, so uh, that's what the process, yeah. There's a, a, a network that has been formed. Mm -hmm. the Gymnet. The Gymnet, yeah. Gymnet. Yeah. Tell me, A, the Gymnet acronym, and B, the purpose for Gymnet. Uh, yeah, Gymnet um, was um, established uh, about um, a year ago, I think, uh, more than a year now, almost 18 months, um, it was established in, in South Africa. And um, it was um, quite um, interesting, you know, then, you know, uh, major evaluation brought uh, uh, its collaborators from all over the world. Um, uh, we met there and we had um, interesting discussion whether we should uh, establish a network and if we establish a network, what kind of a network should it be and so on. And finally, we agreed uh, we need this. Uh, and um, it was uh, established and the major uh, actually uh, mission for this uh, or goal for Gemnet is um, you know to improve um, uh, training in monitoring and evaluation and also uh, to uh, uh, benefit uh, from uh, capacity built uh, in different parts of the world you know, some centers are very uh, strong in some aspects, others are strong in another aspect. So we uh, want to share materials, we want to share curriculum, we want to share even uh, experts uh, in the long run. Um, so we had, um, uh, we established um, a coordinating committee, which uh, I'm chairing uh, at the moment for the first two years. Um, and we have um, successfully accomplished quite a lot, you know, um, considering, you know, limited resources Gemnet uh, has uh, now. Um, we have uh, uh, now um, more or less uh, drafts for, uh, for Gemnet constitution, you know, uh, how we operate, you know, the membership status and, and so on. That's um, a big uh, achievement. Uh, we have also uh, one of our subcommittees, uh, Capacity Building Committee, has um, uh, done an inventory of resources that are available uh, among uh, partners, among members of the Gemnet, and that has been uh, publicly released uh, last week. So that's also a big um, uh, achievement. And um, yeah, we are hoping in the coming uh, years there will be more resources uh, to, to do uh, collaborative um, uh, workshops to uh, strengthen um, capacity uh, among uh, member institutions uh, and provide uh, better uh, monitoring and evaluation training and services. How do you coordinate the inaccurate like that? That is also uh, interesting. I mean, I have been involved in a lot of networks, but you know, they require some kind of physical meeting and so on. So, so far, since uh, we were established, um, there was no physical meeting among members. You know, we had um, possibilities to meet some of us, you know, when we, uh, uh, when we meet here um, in Addis. But otherwise, you know, we do it through electronic um, communication means. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful for uh, for that, major evaluation uh, has been facilitating that. Uh, 
um, it's good. You can share documents, you can share agenda, um, and people uh, participate from where they are. Um, but of course, sometimes there is challenge uh, to uh, uh, to g get um, you know technology working to its best, but uh, so far it's good. What are the partners or the members of GymNet? What are their core interests in participating in a network of this nature? Um, well, many of them are very enthusiastic about it. Um, it is um, a voluntary membership. I mean, there is, um, um, as I said, you know. Uh, there is no other incentive other than, you know, uh, promoting uh, the cause of um, uh, the GEMNET, which is, you know, to build capacity for better quality monitoring and evaluation training, uh, you know, across the world, across the globe. You know, that's our aim. And people are working very hard, um, participating w very well. Mm -hmm. Even in face-to-face -face meetings, you don't, you don't uh, get quorum sometimes. But so far, I mean, none of our meetings were cancelled. Um, uh, so it's going very well. How does it feel to be part of an effort that is a first? It's, I, you've established the Addis Continental yeah. Institute of Public Health. That's a first. Yes. You're chairing a global network of academic institutions. That's the first. Mm. What is what is that feeling like? Well, it. Uh, I feel um, I'm privileged to have this opportunity, but um, I also see it uh, as uh, as a challenge and huge responsibility. Uh, um, you know, sometimes you are lucky. You know, things go according to plans and so on. But sometimes, you know, you also, you also come to a crossroad, you know, where you find it's difficult, you know, uh, to move forward. Um, but uh, both uh, with Artist Continental and Gemnet, I think we are on course and uh, we are doing very well. I'm very happy. And I feel privileged for that. <laughs> what are your top three challenges? in establishing an institute of this size? And what are your top three opportunities in establishing an institute of this size? Well, one of the challenges is, of course, you know, it requires a tremendous amount of time and effort. Um, uh, second thing um, is, um, um, you know, building trust. Yeah, you know, we are working on making a brand for Artis Continental. You know, what's Artis Continental, what it's doing. And it's not easy to sell that uh, uh, in a short uh, time. Uh, so again, you know, we're lucky because um, we really focus on quality and we really focus on delivering our promises or more uh, than we promise. So that is... Um, the third thing is, of course, you know, there is, um, you know, the whole um, uh, environment, you know, the uh, external environment will also affect you uh, in a country where everything has been run from public institution, you know, establishing a private uh, organization and uh, claiming that you are working for quality, for um, expanding access and so on. Uh, you know, people are skeptical about that, you know. So overcoming that was a big challenge. Um, but um, yeah, there are also opportunities, um, you know. Uh, one is um, now um, we have established ourselves as a credible organization, institution. Um, we, um, we work as an open institute where, you know, anybody who is interested in our mission goal could join us for a short time or long time. And, um, and uh, that's a very nice thing, you know, you meet people, you, um, uh, 
Uh, and uh, the third thing is, of course, you know, we see a lot of our graduates going out, you know, filling positions. Um, um, when we started, we talked uh, with the Minister of Health and they had uh, the ambition of having at least one master's graduate in public health in every district in Ethiopia. Uh, we have some 850 or so uh, districts. So when we calculated, you know, how long would it take us, you know, to put one master's in every district? And, um, and then um, we set our agenda by that. And we said, you know, we need to work with um, uh, a lot of partners, we cannot do it alone. Uh, and we need to, to do this quickly. Uh, so we strategize and we started working with public universities that are already reputable and the government has trust on them, um, public has trust on them, uh, we have trust on them. Um, so we said, you know, it is a win-win situation, you know, why don't we work together, build their capacity and uh, also um, fulfill our um, goals, ambitions. Um, so we started working uh, every year. We started adding at least one public university, uh, and by now, you know, we have uh, we are working with six uh, universities. Um, but the most interesting is, you know, three of the universities have now declared that they can be independent of us. You know, we we started from scratch with Aramaya University, and uh, now they are doing it independently. We still work together. But the master's program, they run it in harder without us, you know. That's a, a great thing. In Magali, the same thing happened. We worked with, together for three years, and then we said, we are ready, you know, we can do it. And they are doing it the same way, or even better uh, now. Uh, Awasa University, the same, that we had meeting um, some, a month ago, and they said, you know, we are ready, you know, from September we can go alone. And that's a great thing. So we uh, have worked to uh, established three centers. Um, and I'm sure uh, the other three universities that we are working um, would uh, definitely uh, take over this activity and continue working independently. Um, uh, so that's um, the, uh, the nice thing about uh, all your efforts, you know, you put a lot of effort, you know, it's very exhausting at some, you know, in the process, but yeah, it makes you happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I had uh, um, some students, you know, fairly senior level people, you know, they came to me the first time and they say, you know, Professor, you know, what are you going to teach us? You know, we have been doing this, you know, for the last 15 years, 20 years, you know, we know everything. You know, the only thing is we don't have the degree and... But these people, when they finished the program, they came to me and said, you know, we learned quite a lot. Now we encourage actually all our colleagues to come and uh, attend school because the knowledge we have obtained is completely different, you know. Things have changed, people are, uh, things are dynamic and uh, we come to understand that. Uh, and, and one of the experts said, you know, I now wonder, you know, whether I am still an expert on, on this issue because he said, you know, you taught us, uh, you know, we got a lot from this program. Even in the area where I think uh, I, I am the leading expert in Ethiopia, I got a lot, you know, because, you know, when people go to uh, professional practice, you know, they, they detach from research, from new knowledge, um, and they don't know how to get that and how to access that knowledge. So one of the great things they learn here is to access new knowledge, you know, that's relevant to their uh, professional practice. Uh, yeah. So how, how are people able to access new knowledge as they're practicing, and how is knowledge made available um, on behalf, or from the Institute? Yeah. You, you know, the technology has changed everything. Um, I, I tell this story for my students every time, you know. When I was doing my PhD in Sweden, you know, I used to carry 
uh, you know, photocopy of articles, sometimes 20, 25 kilograms of paper, you know, to just bring home and read. Now people uh, get access through different partners. You know, major evaluation provides us quite a lot of materials on specifically with on monitoring and evaluation. And we're also very grateful to WHO that provides us um, access to over 2,500 journals through uh, what, you, what we call Hinari access. So there is a particular password uh, that you could use um, in, uh, in developing countries. So they uh, actually get access to a lot. And the uh, development of uh, open access journals like uh, the BMCs and the, there are others also. Uh, so people can get access to that. Uh, and also the technology is helping them now. Internet access is uh, improving. Um, even in Ethiopia, you go to remote areas where, you know, uh, cell phone network is available. You can access also your internet. Um, uh, so um, about 90% of our students are working also at the same time while they are studying. So it's very good for them, you know, to have this connection. They go to the field. They just have to go with a small gadget that connects them to internet. And um, it's not very expensive. Um, they get access to that. So, the, so just knowing that, you know, that knowledge is actually abundantly available now compared to even 10 years ago makes a big difference for uh, people. Hmm? Excellent. Any closing remarks? In summary, what have we learned in the past six years about how to build the capacity of the public health professional, particularly monitoring the evaluation? Yeah, uh, well, one of the things is um, you need to engage closely, work closely, uh, and also understand the needs. A very good uh, example is uh, the Malaria Associate Award. You know, when we started, we started working uh, at the health centers. So the first time uh, we went there, you know, people were very skeptical. What are you doing here, you know, and so on. And slowly we started working with them, you know, said, you know, these are, um, you know, evidences that you need for decision. But um, they never saw data used for decision making. And um, our um, uh, aim for the project was actually to detect the epidemics, malaria epidemics early, and save lives. So the first, uh, we continued uh, our data collection, but uh, we talked with people. But they, they, we, sent the, we start sending them, uh, you know, a summary of the findings. But they were not uh, used to that. And then um, we discuss with people and say, then say, why don't we establish a review meeting? So that instead of just sending the summary findings, we go to uh, the health center, actually sit with them, and uh, explain what the findings are, you know, compare uh, their achievement with other health centers. Then people were extremely happy. They were, you see, interest building, um, no complaint um, as before. Uh, and then, you know, we, uh, we, we thought, you know, we are doing it quarterly. And then later on, we decided, why don't we do it monthly? If this is more, a more effective way of doing it, if it's a more effective way of motivating people to do a good quality, you know, to uh, help us, you know, collect good quality data, we, we would do it monthly. And people are happy with that. And, um, um, it just uh, tells us, you know, um, one, you need to be patient, second, you know, we need to engage them, work closely with people, uh, and then they see the, the value of evidence. In Excellent. So, briefly, if we could cover the Associate Award, the Malaria mm -hmm. Associate Award. What's the nature of the Associate Award and its purpose? Yeah, this is, uh, again, another partnership we have um, through major evaluation with Tulane University. And here, uh, one of the big regions in Ethiopia, the Oromia Regional Health Bureau, 
Uh, and the, the whole idea is actually, uh, you know, the government uh, in partnership with, uh, uh, with international partners has uh, invested quite a lot in malaria prevention and control. Um, so the, uh, our uh, interest was to see whether that had made any impact, you know, uh, whether morbidity had been declining and what, what is the trend. Second thing is, um, and more interesting was, if mortality had been uh, eliminated in, uh, from malaria. So we uh, have been collecting information on morbidity and mortality. Uh, we have seen um, interesting um, uh, trends, yeah, especially in mortality. Um, we have seen, I think, a couple of deaths uh, in the last four years in, in our surveillance sites, which shows uh, that the interventions were very effective because malaria used to be one of the killers uh, of uh, children, pregnant women in, in Ethiopia, and uh, that's what uh, we have seen. Uh, and uh, through these projects also, we are thinking of sustainability, but it worked, uh, as I explained earlier, uh, because we are doing um, supervision and we are providing feedback uh, on a regular basis. So we thought, you know, this is um, a more expensive way of doing things. So we tried to find out a, a simpler, cheaper solution. What we found was uh, the SMS. So uh, instead of people going, you know, the health workers can actually text the data directly to um, a database here in Addis. And the database compiles everything and actually sends report immediately, you know, on a weekly basis to these people. And that technology is, is quite cheap. Yeah, if people use it, nah, it's quite cheap. Um, you don't need any special cell phone. Any cell phone can be used. Uh, they just have to text the data in a certain sequence. That's the only thing. Otherwise, any, any kind of uh, cell phone can be used. So that's uh, the great thing about the technology. There has been a lot of interest from the Minister of Health uh, and UNICEF particularly was interested in this. Uh, we have shared our experience uh, and hopefully, um, you know, you can also get a better and wider coverage with this kind of uh, cheap technology. Um, so that's, uh, those are the two things, you know, uh, with this associate award. What are the, what have we found you mentioned the trends in mortality were very interesting. What are those trends? Well, what we saw uh, was mortality has substantial. I think we registered um, uh, not more than five days in the last uh, four years in, in these sites. And this shows you there is uh, related to malaria. I mean, uh, or at least as far as we know, it's, that is related to malaria that happened in health facilities. But this is uh, achieved because um, treatment is widely available now. And you don't have to be treated by nurses or uh, doctors, you know, even the, what we call the health extension workers, you know, the lowest level health cadres in this country. They can provide treatment for malaria. And that was a big success. The second thing is also the widespread use of uh, other interventions like um, uh, bed nets uh, uh, were, were distributed um, uh, widely. And in a couple of places where we had epidemics, uh, we noticed that you know, bed nets distribution was not done um, or were not refilled you know, after some. So, um, so this is, I think, um, um, one of the inputs also, uh, we are currently also engaged uh, with US USAID to do uh, malaria impact evaluation. And this uh, information is quite useful to show. Um, it's not a representative uh, information for uh, the entire country, but at least you know, it shows uh, in areas where um, um, you know, interventions were closely monitored they were effective in, in reducing mortality at least. Have you found or, or um, witnessed any evidence that 
the regional health bureau is really beginning to take ownership of this um, malaria surveillance? So what's their uh, there is a national movement, you know, to improve generally the health management information system, and there are a lot of partners working in that. Uh, so right now, you know, this project specifically was focusing on malaria, because this is one of uh, the, th the three or four main uh, programs. Uh, but the Regional Health Bureau and uh, the organization which is um, mandated for organizing health information, which is called the Ethiopian Health Nutrition Research Institute. Um, they they uh, showed interest. We had several meetings with them, and we're still negotiating with them, you know, whether uh, they want to use the same tools uh, or adapt these tools, you know, to ex expand, yeah. That's excellent. Wow, so many successes. Yeah. <laughs> Luck and luckily. <laughs> yeah, and the time frame is so short. It is. It's very short, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. How many people are employed here? Uh, we are about 70 people who are working full time here. Yeah, but we have uh, many uh, part time employees also Excellent. who come and help us on specific issues. Yeah. How many staff members did you begin with? We start with five. <laughs> yeah, it's five people. Yeah, uh, and we struggle quite a lot. Even paying salary for five people was not easy at the beginning. Yeah, because we didn't have any project we started. You know, we we had only big heart. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is the last question for you, and that is, why did you choose this profession, public health? Well, you know, I chose uh, public health because, um, you see, as a young doctor, I was sent to a rural hospital. And uh, uh, in six months, you know, they asked me to be the medical director of the hospital. And uh, I said, okay, but uh, I didn't know what to do. But, uh, you know, I said, okay. At, uh, and um, at that time, you know, the organization is, uh, uh, was different than what we have today. And uh, under the hospital, I didn't know that we had so many responsibilities, but there were 32 health centers and health stations that were supervised by the uh, hospital. So the first thing, you know, I was uh, introduced uh, with a new challenge, you know, how do you actually manage uh, uh, all these health services, you know, make sure, you know, things are running and so on. But uh, more importantly, within three months or four months uh, after I became the medical director, there was a huge meningitis epidemic in the country and uh, people were dying because uh, um, infrastructure was not so great at that time, you know, that's uh, over 20 years ago. So we started working and uh, the health services were not enough to provide treatment. So we started um, erecting tents in the villages, you know, um, so uh, taking inpatients and working 24 hours the clock, um, providing immunization to uh, hundreds and thousands of people, you know. So, uh, so then um, I was uh, practically introduced to public health there, you know, what it takes, you know. And uh, I see the, um, the magic of vaccination uh, then, you know. While we are treating, you know, the, f the flow of uh, patients decreased as we provided more and more vaccination. So that was really uh, a practical experiment, you know, seeing how, uh, how much and uh, how how quickly you could actually uh, make uh, improvement in health if you provide prevention and cure the material. So that started my public health life. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> and in, in looking back on the experience, what role does what role did monitoring and evaluation play at that time? And what's the important role that monitoring and evaluation plays today? Uh, at that time, you know, monitoring evaluation, 
I wouldn't say even whether it, I'm not sure whether it existed at that time. You know, we, we haven't heard about this word. Um, yeah. You know, there were routine data collections. Uh, but uh, if I remember correctly, you know, data would be analyzed and results would be made available after three or four years. So by then, you know, you can't use those for uh, planning um, your program. So that, you know, you have to sort of um, do crisis management every time. Uh, and if you see now, um, at a national level, things are changing. At least we get... Um, the data analyzed and report is released every year, uh, so people have a better opportunity uh, to use. And people are uh, now evaluated for the results that uh, they have achieved, uh, so which means they have to monitor what they have been doing, what results they obtain. Uh, so I would say, you know, there is a complete shift. Uh, you know. Even in the mindset have changed, you know, in the old days, you, know, you never think of uh, you know, making assessment at the end of the year, you know, doing evaluation. But now, you know, plants are uh, more formal, you know, at the country level, we have every year uh, uh, review meetings at the Federal Ministry of Health that tries to see what were achieved, what were challenges, how should we continue in the future. So there, there is a big uh, change. And my last question is, could you summarize in one sentence why monitoring and evaluation is important? Uh, monitoring and evaluation is important because we are always short of resources and we need to use resources appropriately to improve uh, uh, the um, uh, health status of uh, our population. And I would say monitoring and evaluation is more important for countries like ours, where resources are uh, even limited. So uh, for some people, it may be a luxury. For me, monitoring and evaluation is a necessity if you want to see a better um, um, life for populations.